every single time that Asahi Linux crosses my radar, I am continuously impressed by it. It is one thing to get Linux booting on this hardware with no support from Apple. It is another thing to get a graphical environment running. It is another thing, again, to have a graphical environment that is GPU accelerated using OpenGL. Again, with no support from Apple. All of this is being done through comparing with similar architectures and reverse engineering. And then it's another thing for the most recent endeavor, introducing Honeycrisp, the world's first conformant Vulkan 1.3 driver for Apple Silicon. Please note that Honeycrisp is still under heavy development and not ready for end users yet, nor are we shipping it at this time. It is conformant and that is a major milestone and demonstrates what is possible, and importantly, what is possible when you write a native Vulkan driver instead of relying on less than ideal vendor metal drivers on the macOS base. But there is still plenty of improvement and optimization and feature work to be done before we can recommend using it for games. Please use WineD3D and the OpenGL driver for the time being. Once we consider it ready for production workloads, we will ship it in our packages. Obviously, it's still very much a work in progress. Now, the reason it's a work in progress is how long it took to come together. Vulcan 1.3 on the M1 in one month. That's how long they spent writing the driver. Now, obviously, this was not made in a vacuum. We live in a world where there are open source Vulkan 1.3 conformant drivers that can be used as reference material. And that is what was done in this situation. But Honeycrisp is not based on the prior M1 Vulkan efforts. Instead, it is based on Faith Extran's open source NVK driver for the NVIDIA GPUs. For anyone out of the loop, this is a big part of the reason why open source NVIDIA support is now actually somewhat viable. Obviously, there is a lot of other stuff with the GSP firmware, but if you want to play games on Linux, for the most part, there is some OpenGL stuff, but for the most part, you're going to want to have Vulkan support. The main reason for that is the whole DXVK, DirectX to Vulkan. If you don't have the Vulkan there, DXVK is not going to do much. All Vulkan drivers in Mesa trace their lineage to the Intel Vulkan driver and started by copying and pasting from it. My hope is that NVK will eventually become the driver that everyone copies and pastes from. To that end, I'm building NVK with all the best practices we've developed for Vulkan drivers over the last 7.5 years and trying to keep the code base clean and well organized. Why spend years implementing features from scratch when we can reuse NVK? There will be friction starting out, given NVIDIA's desktop architecture differs from the M1's mobile roots. In exchange, we get a modern driver designed for desktop games. Even if a project is not a direct fork from another, basically every project out there takes some inspiration from something else out there. And I've talked about this a lot in the case of Wayland Compositors. There's no need to start entirely from scratch. There are projects out there that already make use of the WL Roots library. So just build off of that. We'll need to pass half a million tests ensuring correctness, submit the results, and then will become conformant after 30 days of industry review. That's why this starts on April 2nd and we're in June now because they finished the driver in a month. There was the 30 day review and then they become conformant. Starting from NVK and our OpenGL 4.6 driver, can we write a driver passing the Vulkan 1.3 conformance test suite faster than the 30 day review period? It's unprecedented. Challenge accepted. Everything began on April 2nd. It begins with a text. Faith, I think I want to write a Vulkan driver. Her advice? just start typing. That might sound like terrible advice, but it actually is good, right? You're never going to get anything done unless you just start going and doing it. You might make something terrible and it's probably going to be terrible, but just go and do it. There's no copy pasting yet. We just add M1 code to NVK and remove NVIDIA as we go. Since the kernel mediates our access to the hardware, we begin connecting NVK to Lena's kernel driver using code shared with OpenGL. Then we plug in our shader compiler and hit the hay. The next day starts with GPU descriptors. To access resources, GPUs use descriptors containing the address, 
format, and size of a resource. Vulkan bundles descriptors into sets per the application's descriptor set layout. As our descriptors differ from NVIDIA's, our next task is adapting NVK's descriptor set lowering. We start with a simple but correct approach, deleting far more code than we add. As this is starting from a complete driver and trying to adapt it to a whole nother architecture, a lot of the code can be reused. But a lot of other code is going to be very, very architecture specific and just needs to be deleted. Now for context, a descriptor set layout is used to describe the content of a list of descriptor sets. And then a descriptor set is a set of descriptors. With working descriptors with the ability to access resources, we can compile compute shaders. Now we program the fixed function hardware to dispatch compute. We first add bookkeeping to map Vulkan command buffers to lists of M1 control streams. Then we generate a compute control stream. We copy that code from our OpenGL driver, translate the GL into Vulkan, and compute works. That's enough to move on to copies of buffers and images. We implement Vulkan's copies with compute shaders, internally dispatched with Vulkan commands as if we were the application. The first copy tests pass. The next day, fleshing out the rest of that code, and then all of the copy tests pass. Now at this point, no graphics have been shown. This is all about just passing around resources. GPUs have plenty of other uses, but when we're talking about gaming, graphics is kind of a big deal. Now we're ready to tackle graphics. The novelty is handling graphic state like depth and stencil. That's straightforward, but there's a lot of state to handle. Depth is used to control which areas of polygons are rendered rather than hidden from view. And then stencil is used to mask pixels in an image to produce special effects, including compositing, dissolves, fades, swipes, outlines, silhouettes, things like that. Faith's code collects all dynamic state into a single structure, which we translate into hardware control words. As usual, we grab that translation from our OpenGL driver, blend with NVK, and move on. What makes state dynamic? Dynamic state can change without recompiling shaders. By contrast, static state is baked into shader binaries called pipelines. If games create all their pipelines during a load screen, there is no compiler stutter during gameplay. The idea hasn't quite panned out. Many game developers don't know their state ahead of time, so cannot create pipelines early. We want full dynamic state and shader objects. Unfortunately, the M1 bakes random state into shaders. Vertex attributes, fragment outputs, blending, even linked interpolation qualifiers. Like most of the industry in the 2010s, the M1 designers bet on pipelines. Faced with this hardware, a reasonable driver developer would double down on pipelines. DXVK would stutter, but would pass conformance. I am not reasonable. To eliminate stuttering in OpenGL, we make state dynamic with four strategies. Conditional code, pre-compiled variants, indirection, prologues, and epilogues. AMD also bakes state into shaders, with a twist. They divide the hardware binary into three parts. Prologue, shader, and an epilogue. Confining dynamic state to the periphery as in the prologue and the epilogue eliminates shader variants. They compile prologues and epilogues on the fly, but that's fast and doesn't stutter. Linking shader parts is a quick concatenation, or long jumps avoid linking altogether. This strategy works for the M1 too. For Honeycrisp, let's follow NVK's lead and treat all state as dynamic. No other Vulkan driver has implemented full dynamic state and shader objects this early on, but it avoids refactoring later. And considering the goal was to write this in a month, not having to refactor later is a nice thing. Today we add the code to build, compile, and cache prologues and epilogues. Putting it together, we get a dynamic triangle. Now we have graphics actually rendering. The next day was just following the tests, getting issues resolved, making it more and more conformant, and that was enough to get VK Quake working. Not the most intensive game, but it functioned. By just one week into driver development, Honeycrisp had a 99.6% pass rate for Vulkan 1.1. But why stop there? NVK is 1.3 conformant, so let's just claim 1.3 and skip to the finish line. That already had a 98.3% pass rate. By the next day, Super Tux Cart with a Vulkan renderer.
the day after that, Zinc was working as well. Zinc is how you do OpenGL calls translated into Vulkan calls. Now, the next few updates aren't that exciting, so we're just going to jump up to the 18th. Remember copies. You know, that thing we talked about, I don't know, like five or so minutes ago, before we actually had any graphics working. They work, but they're slow, and every frame currently requires a copy to get on screen. For zero copy rendering, we need enough Linux Windows system integration to negotiate an efficient surface layout across process boundaries. Linux users modifies for this purpose, so we implement the ext image DRM format modifier extension, and by implement, I mean copy. Copies to avoid copies. Once again, relying on NVK. As bug fixing slows down, we step back and check our driver architecture. Since we treat all state as dynamic, we don't prepack control words during pipeline creation. That adds theoretical CPU overhead. Is that a problem? After some optimizations, VK overhead says we're pushing 100 million draws per second. I think we're okay. Query copies are next. In Vulkan, the application can query the number of samples rendered, writing the result into an opaque query pool. The result can be copied from the query pool on the CPU or GPU. For the GPU, we need to repack in a compute shader that's harder because we can't just run C on the GPU, right? Actually, we can. A little witchcraft makes GPU query copies as easy as C. Now, Easy and C are not things I would expect to hear in the same sentence, but in the context of C, this is what I would expect. The final boss. Border colors. Hard mode. Direct3D lets the application choose an arbitrary border color when creating a sampler. By contrast, Vulkan only requires three border colors. Transparent black, opaque black, and opaque white. Now, these cases were handled on an earlier day, but first we need custom border colors for Direct3D compatibility. Both the DXVK and VKD3D Proton require the EXT custom border color extension, because the whole point of doing this is making it so DXVK is going to work. If DXVK is not going to work, a big use case for having Vulkan support kind of goes out the window. Second, there's a subtle problem with our hardware causing dozens of fails even without custom border colors. To understand the issue, let's revisit text descriptors which contain a pixel format and component reordering swizzle. So swizzle is a weird fancy GPU term. It basically just means take the vector and then rearrange the components. Some formats are implicitly reordered. Common BGRA formats swapped red and blue for historical reasons. The M1 does not support these formats. Instead, the driver composes the swizzle from the formats reordering. If the application uses a BARB swizzle with a BGRA format, the driver uses an RABR swizzle with an RGBA format. This paragraph right here almost perfectly encapsulates why I have no interest in getting involved in really low-level development. This is just a soup of terms that you need to make sure you get correct, otherwise things are probably going to go really badly. Now there's a catch. Swizzles apply to the border color, but formats do not. We need to undo the format reordering when programming the border color for correct results. After the hardware applies the Compose Swizzle, our OpenGL driver implements border colors this way because it knows the texture format when creating the sampler. Unfortunately, Vulkan does not give us that information. Without custom border color support, we should be okay. Swapping red and blue doesn't change anything if the color is white or black. There's an even subtler catch. Vulkan mandates support for packed 16-bit format with 4-bit components. The M1 supports a similar format, but with reverse endiness, swapping the red and the alpha. That seems okay, for transparent black, all zero, or opaque white, all one, swapping components doesn't change the result. The problem is opaque black. Swapping the alpha channel and the red channel gives you transparent red. A reasonable person would give up. But again, I am not reasonable. Let's jump into the deep end. If we implement custom border colors, opaque black becomes a special case. 
but how? The M1's custom border color entangles the texture format with a sampler. A reasonable person would skip direct 3D support. As you know, I am not reasonable. Although the hardware is unsuitable, we control software. Whenever a shader samples a texture, we'll inject code to fix up the border color. This emulation is simple, correct, and slow. We'll use dirty driver tricks to speed it up later. For now, we eat the cost, advertise full custom border colors, and pass the opaque black test. After that, and after some last minute bug fixing, everything passes. Now reaching conformance is the baseline. Now you have a driver that works. There is a lot more work to do from here. The next task is implementing everything that DXVK and VKD3D Proton require to layer Direct 3D. That includes esoteric extensions like Transform Feedback. Then Wine and an open source x86 emulator will run Windows games on Asahi Linux. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. In the meantime, enjoy Linux games with our conformant OpenGL 4.6 drivers and stay tuned. As I said at the start, I am constantly impressed with what is happening in this project. It is constantly getting better and better and better. And I don't know where it's going to be in a year, two years from now, but I have a feeling you're just going to have perfectly working support and you don't really have to think about it. But what do you think? Have you been playing around with this Apple Silicon hardware? Are you excited for this change happening? And are you like me who is just always impressed by what is happening here. I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe to the Pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me and my voice is dying.